Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and in this video, I'm gonna be teaching you how to play Marrakesh. The city of Marrakesh in southwestern Morocco is known as the Pearl of the South. It was founded in the year 1070 AD and is one of the country's four royal cities. In this game, players take on the role of an influential family in the city, aiming to achieve the most honourable titles through the skillful use of assistance, caches and resources. During the game, players will be using their assistants in the corresponding sectors of their player boards. Each assistant can either be used to add a new keshi to that sector or to perform the action of the sector. Players can advance their fishermen up the river, pick dates from their orchard, acquire luxury goods from the souks, entertain the audience at the main square, advance up the palace and the mosque staircases to gain bonuses, study at the madrasa to gain scrolls, deploy guards to gates of the medina, and travel across the Sahara, discovering and establishing links to the various oases in the desert. At the end of each season, players must meet the needs of their people by supplying them with resources. After three seasons, the game ends, and after final scoring, the player with the most points becomes the most influential family in Marrakesh and wins the game. Thank you to Queen Games for sponsoring this video, but I also rely on the financial support of my Patreon campaign to keep the channel going. So if you want to support me directly and help me continue to make videos, you can do so by becoming one of my Patreon supporters at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. In this video, I'm going to be using the components from the classic version of the game. If you have the deluxe version, some of your components will be different. Also, this video covers the big box version of the game. If you have the essential edition, some things are represented in a different way, but the rules are still the same. Place the game board in the middle of the playing area. Construct the tower and place it somewhere nearby where it won't accidentally get knocked. Take the scrolls and sort them by their backs. Shuffle each type separately and divide them into three face down stacks of equal size. Place each stack on the corresponding academy on the game board and then reveal the top scroll of each stack. Take the exchange offices and remove the ones with the pattern in the green band. These are for one of the expansions. Shuffle the remaining ones and choose three at random, placing them face down on the exchange office here. Then reveal the top tile. Take the luxury goods, shuffle them and place them in five face down stacks of equal size here. Then reveal the top tile of each stack. Take the river tiles and sort them by their season icons. Each tile is double sided, so there are six different options for each season. Randomly select one tile for each season. For your first game, it's recommended that you use tiles numbered 1, 3 and 5. Place the river tile for the first season on the end of the river and the other two just above the game board. Take the city gates and put them into the cloth bag. Mix them up and then draw eight of them at random for each of the workshops. Sort the resources by type, water, dates and dinars and place them nearby as a common supply. Also, place a common supply of keshes nearby. Each player takes the following components in their chosen player colour. One player board, one supply board, six player pawns, one scoring marker, a 100 stroke 200 marker and one screen. Place your player board in front of you with your supply board above it. On your supply board, place one water, one date and one dinar. Take an audience disc and place it in the bottom right of your player board, pink side up, in an orientation of your choice. For your first game, don't worry too much about this, just place it randomly. Each player then places certain components on the following places of the game board. The scoring markers start on space 10 of the scoring track. One pawn as a fisherman on the starting space of the river. Another pawn as a courtier on the bottom space of the palace stairway. And another as a student on the bottom space of the mosque stairway. Keep your remaining three pawns next to your player board. These are your assistants. Take the oasis tiles and mix them all face down. Each player takes six of them at random, placing them on the designated places in the desert sector of their player board without looking at them. Return the rest of the oasis tiles to the box unseen. Take the provision tiles and mix them all face down. Each player takes three of them at random. Look at the three tiles you have, choose one and place it face up above your supply board. The depicted resources are what you will need to meet the needs of your people at the end of this season. Place the other two face down, the order does not matter. Take one keshi of each of the 12 colours and place them behind your screen. Put eight keshis in the cloth bag, one for each colour except yellow, purple, orange and brown. Each player draws two keshis randomly from the bag and places them in any order on spaces one and four of their oasis track. In a two player game, each player draws three keshis from the bag instead of two and places them on spaces one, two and four. Finally, choose a start player at random, giving them the season tracker, which is Stefan Feld himself, 
and also give them the Round Tracker, which is Stefan's personal camel, who I like to call Charles. With setup complete, you're now ready to start playing. The game is played over three seasons. In each season, you have 12 caches, one of each colour behind your screen. A season is divided into four rounds, each consisting of four phases. The player with the camel is the start player for the whole of the round. In phase one, players secretly choose three of their caches for the current round. These caches indicate which actions you will perform later in the round. All caches chosen for that round are dropped into the tower and any that fall out are placed on the matching spaces. In phase two, players take turns claiming caches and placing them on their player boards. The more caches you have in a sector make future actions there more powerful. In phase three, each player uses each of their assistants, either to add a new cache to the sector or to perform the action of that sector. At the end of each round, there is a bonus for each player based on how far they have advanced along the river. And after four rounds, players will have no more caches behind their screen and the season ends. There is a bonus for the player who advanced furthest on the river and then all fishermen are reset to the start. Each player must then provide resources for their citizens who get more demanding each season. After three seasons, the game ends and players score bonus points for completely filled sectors of their player board, their claimed oasis tiles and any leftover resources. And the player with the most points wins the game. At the start of each round, all players simultaneously and secretly select three of their caches from behind their screen and hold them in their hand. Once everyone has done so, everyone reveals the caches they selected. Your choice of caches is of course very important and you need to take a few things into account when making your selection. After a couple of games, you'll start to have some more ideas about this, but for your first game, don't worry too much about it, just select three and see what happens. Starting with the player with the camel and then going clockwise, each player deploys their three assistants onto their player board in the sectors corresponding to the colours of the caches they selected. For example, if you chose the green, grey and the blue caches, you would place your assistants here, here and here. Make sure you place the assistant on your coloured space, not the space for the gates. The souk is a special area. If you selected the orange, yellow or purple caches, you place an assistant on this space, which is why there is space for three assistants. You could select these three caches, for example, and you would place all three assistants here. The red cache is a water vendor and is also special. Notice that there is no red sector on your player board. When you choose this cache, deploy an assistant to anywhere there is space for them. It is effectively a wild card. The red cache is the reason why doing this in turn order is important. In fact, if nobody or only one player selected a red cache, then only that player has any choice to make. So everyone can deploy their assistant simultaneously. But if two or more players select their red cache, the decision about where to place that assistant must be done in player order. After all players have deployed their assistants, collect all of the selected caches together and drop them into the tower. Some may get stuck inside and some stuck from previous rounds may be dislodged and fall out. The caches which fall out of the bottom of the tower should then be placed on their matching coloured spaces. Be careful not to knock the tower in case any more fall out. In turn order, each player takes up to two caches of the same colour from those available. These caches are then immediately placed on the cache spaces in the matching sector of their player board. The blue caches are fishes and are placed in the river. The white caches are nobles and are placed in the palace. The black caches are clerics and are placed in the mosque. Grey caches are scholars and are placed in the madrasa. Yellow, orange and purple caches represent trading goods. Each one is placed in the matching souk. Light brown caches are guards and are placed in the watchtower space of the Medina in the centre of the player board. The green caches are date pickers and are placed in the orchard. For each one you place, you get an immediate bonus of one point as depicted on the space. Pink caches are entertainers. They are placed in the main square on any empty space. When you place one, you get an immediate bonus of whatever is printed next to the space. For example, if you take two entertainers and place them here and here, you gain one water and move one step up the mosque staircase. All of the bonuses are explained in the rulebook. The dark brown caches are caravans. When placing caravans, you must follow one of the three routes available to you. Your first cache can head along any of the three routes and can be placed here, here or here. If you go here, this is an oasis that you already know about and you gain any two resources. Once you have placed a cache on the first space, the second one becomes available to you which has a deployment bonus of two points. However, you don't need to finish one route before starting along another one. You can progress on all three routes simultaneously. 
For example, you could place your first Keshi here, and then the next one here. And whenever you place a Keshi on one of the upper six spaces, you immediately reveal the adjacent Oasis tile. And from here, your next Keshi could be placed here, here, or even start the third route here. The final Keshi to explain is the red water vendor. In each sector of your player board, except for the Souk, there is a water vendor space where exactly one red Keshi may be placed. Water vendors gain you one water each time you use an assistant in their sector, and they're required to complete a sector, which will get you points at the end of the game. Players keep taking Keshis until there are none left, and usually the number of Keshis taken will be different for each player. You cannot take any Keshis that you are unable to place, so if your palace is filled with nobles, you cannot take any more white Keshis. And similarly, if you only have space for one date picker, but there were two or more green Keshis available, you can only take one. It can happen that you end up unable to take any Keshis because the only ones available to you are for sectors that are already full. In this case, you just skip your turns for the rest of this phase. In turn order, each player uses each of their assistants on their player board in the order of their choice. You must completely resolve an assistant before moving on to the next one. Once an assistant has been used, remove it from your board and place it nearby ready for the next round. When you use an assistant, you have two choices. You can either take a new Keshi matching the sector with the assistant or perform the action of that sector. Whichever option you choose, if there is a water vendor in the sector, you gain one water before doing anything else. The first option of taking a new Keshi is easy. You take it from the common supply and place it in the sector following the same rules as mentioned earlier. If you place a green, pink or dark brown Keshi, you get the deployment bonus as I described earlier in phase two. For an assistant in the souk, you take either a yellow, orange or purple Keshi and place it in the corresponding space. There is no limit to the number of Keshis in these spaces. The second option for an assistant is performing the action of the sector. This is going to take me a little bit longer to explain, so I'll go through each of them individually. However, there is one common rule for all of them. The more Keshis you have in a sector, the more powerful the action. The easiest one to explain is the orchard. You gain one date for each date picker in this sector. So here you would gain three dates, placing them on your supply board. When performing the action in the river, you advance your fisherman one step on the river track for each fish you have. If you have two fish, that's two spaces up the river. If you end on a space containing another player's fisherman, place your fisherman just behind theirs as the order is important. And also note these bonuses on the rapids. You do not get these bonuses when you pass this line. That only happens at the end of a round. And since we're talking about moving the fisherman, there is an important rule that applies whenever you move the fisherman, either through this action or any other means. Whenever the fisherman advances, you may choose to pay as much water as you want to advance more steps on the river, one water per step. This can be a crucial thing to do when used just at the right time. When you land on the final space, which is the jetty, place your fisherman on the rightmost empty spot and immediately gain the number of points for that spot. From now on, if you would ever advance more on the river, gain one point for each space you would have advanced. Advancing on the river track is useful, as there are end of round bonuses for passing the rapids, and there is an end of season bonus for whoever advanced the furthest. The fishermen on the river are not reset at the end of each round, but they are at the end of each season. The action in the souk is to either visit the exchange office or to acquire a luxury good. To visit the exchange office, look at the current exchange office tile. Spend one yellow, purple or orange Keshi from your player board to receive the resources indicated. Here, for example, you could spend one lamp to gain two dates, one carpet to gain two water or one bag of spice to gain two dinars. To spend a Keshi, simply remove it from your souk and place it back in the common supply. You can only exchange one Keshi in total for each assistant who performs this action. The other option for an assistant in the souk is to acquire one luxury good from those available. Spend the caches indicated at the top of the tile and gain the points and any resources indicated at the bottom. Then take the good and place it near your player board. It may be worth bonus points at the end of the game, depending on the type of good depicted. At the end of your turn, reveal the next tile from the stack. If you have more than one assistant in the souk and use them to buy luxury goods, you can only buy from the ones visible at the start of your turn. So if you had two assistants and wanted them both to buy luxury goods, you can but you only reveal the next tile from a stack at the end of your turn, after resolving both of your assistants. If a stack is ever emptied, take half of the tiles from the bottom of the largest other stack and place them into the empty shop, then reveal the top tile. The main square is all about entertaining. 
When performing the action of this sector, you first rotate your audience disc clockwise by one section. Then choose one of your caches and gain the bonus depicted a number of times equal to the number of spectators showing on that section of the disc. For example here, you could choose this section and you would gain three dates, one per spectator. Or you could choose this section and gain four points, two per spectator. Note that this icon indicates taking a purple, orange or yellow keshi. If you choose this bonus and gain more than one keshi, they have to be of the same type. The palace and the mosque actions work in a similar way to each other. When performing the palace action, your pawn advances one step up the palace staircase for each noble in your palace. And when performing the action of the mosque, your student advances one step up the mosque staircase for each cleric in your mosque. The two staircases are each divided into five sections. When your pawn crosses the threshold into a new section, you immediately receive two benefits. One dinar, as shown on the border between the two sections, and also a connection bonus, which is based on the line connecting the section of both staircases currently occupied by your pawns. For example here, you advance two steps up the palace. Since you crossed into a new section, you gain one dinar. Then you look at the line between this section and the one occupied by your pawn on the mosque staircase. You gain one of these benefits, in this case either one dinar, one space up the river, or one water. And then later, if you move three spaces up the mosque staircase, you gain one dinar for crossing into a new section, and then your choice of one point, one pink keshi, one orange keshi, or one dinar. A summary of these bonuses can be found in the rulebook. It can happen that your pawn crosses more than one threshold during its movement. If that happens, resolve the bonus for crossing the first threshold first, and then the second one. When a pawn arrives on the final step of either the mosque or palace staircase, it remains there for the rest of the game. From now on, you gain one point for each further step you would have advanced on this staircase. The madrasa is a place of study for your scholars. When performing the action here, you count how many scholars you have. You then use those scholars to acquire scrolls, but unlike acquiring luxury goods from the souk, these scholars are not spent. They stay there working hard for you for the rest of the game. Now, this isn't in the rulebook, but the way I like to explain this is that each scholar generates you one point of knowledge, and then when you perform this action, you spend that knowledge to buy scrolls. Any knowledge not spent is lost, but the important thing is that the scholars remain in the madrasa. The number of scholars, or knowledge points, required to acquire a scroll is shown in the top left of the scroll. All of these require one scholar, these require three, these five, and these seven. For example, you have five scholars. You could use all of them to acquire a five-point scroll, or you could acquire a three-point scroll and two one-point scrolls, or you could even just acquire three one-point scrolls and ignore the other two scholars. You don't have to use all of your scholars if you don't want to. Each scroll you take also requires you to spend the dates indicated in the top right. Take each scroll you acquire and place it near your player board. The icon in the top of the scroll tells you when the ability is used. Ones with a lightning bolt on are resolved immediately when you acquire the scroll, and after that they have no effect on the game. This one, for example, gains you one grey keshi. Ones with this icon give you a bonus at the end of a round. This one, for example, gives you additional bonuses for the river. Ones with this icon give you a bonus at the end of a season. This one, for example, also gives bonuses for the river. And ones with the infinity icon give you a permanent bonus for the game. This one gives you one water each time you cross the threshold of either the palace or the mosque staircases. A full summary of all of these tiles can be found in the addendum. New scrolls are not revealed until the end of your turn, so you can only acquire scrolls that were visible to you at the start of your turn. You only reveal the next tile from a stack at the end of your turn after resolving the action. Once a stack is empty, take the bottom half of the largest of the other two stacks of that colour and create a new stack and then reveal the top scroll. But what if none of the scrolls on offer are ones that you want? Or what happens when you know the game and there is a particular one that you're looking for? Well, just before you acquire scrolls, you may pay one dinar to put the top tile of each of the three stacks of one colour on the bottom, and then reveal the next tile of each of those stacks. If you do this, you must acquire one of the tiles that you reveal. The Medina is the central area of your player board, connecting all of the other sectors together. If you remember earlier, whenever you gain a guard keshi, they are placed in your watchtower here. When you perform the action of this sector, you may buy one city gate for each guard in your watchtower. Each gate you buy can be from any of the four workshops. 
The cost of the gate depends on the workshop that you buy it from, and you immediately gain or lose points depending on the workshop. Ones from this workshop are cheap, in fact they are free, but for each one you buy you lose 3 points. Whereas each gate from this workshop must be gold plated or something, because they cost 3 each but they're worth 7 points. Each gate you buy must be immediately placed onto an unoccupied gate space on your board, and you place a guard from your watchtower next to the gate. That guard is now locked to that space for the rest of the game, guarding the gate. After placing the gate you gain 2 points if the colour of the gate matches the colour of the sector. Wait a minute, did I just say if it matches the colour of the sector? Yes, I did, because any colour gates can be built on any empty space, the colour does not have to match. And I'm highlighting this because I've taught this game many times and this is a common rule that people miss. So why would you want to build a gate on a non-matching colour space? Because for each gate you build, you also gain one Keshi of the colour matching the gate. For example, you have two guards in the watchtower, sitting around waiting for a nice gate to guard. You decide to buy two green gates because you want to increase the number of date pickers you have, and you might have a bonus tile for green gates at the end of the game. You place one of these gates at the entrance to the orchard. The colour matches, so you gain two points. You place the other one at the entrance to the mosque. No colour match, so no extra points. But because you placed two green gates, you gain two date pickers from the common supply and place them immediately in your orchard, each one gaining you a placement bonus of one point. The final action to explain is for the Sahara sector of your board. This action allows you to claim one or more oasis tiles that you have previously discovered. Remember that you automatically discover an oasis when you place a Keshi next to the tile. To claim an oasis you must pay the cost printed next to the tile. One dinar to claim either of these two, one water and one date to claim either of these two, and one of each resource to claim either of these two. When you claim an oasis, remove the tile from the Sahara and place it on the leftmost space of your oasis track, gaining the bonus from the space. For the first and fourth spaces, and also the second space in a two-player game, you take the Keshi and immediately deploy it into its sector, following the normal rules. When you place an oasis on this space, you may return any one Keshi deployed on your board back to the common supply, and take one Keshi of another colour, deploying it immediately, gaining any bonus if applicable. You may not return a caravan Keshi, a guard who is guarding a gate, or any of the Keshis from your souk, but you may take one of these in exchange. When you place an oasis tile on this space, you may take one scroll from the display that requires exactly three scholars, which is one of the yellow ones. You do not have to pay the dates. And placing an oasis tile here gains you seven points. Each oasis tile that you have claimed that is moved from the Sahara to your oasis track can earn you additional points at the end of the game, depending on what's printed on it. However, you are only allowed to score three of them at the end of the game. So if you claimed five oasis tiles, then at the end of the game you would score the best three. A full explanation of each oasis tile can be found in the addendum. In the last phase of each round, players check the position of their fishermen on the river. Each player who has crossed at least the first rapid may take one bonus of their choice that is shown above one of the rapids that they have passed. For example, the blue player can choose either this bonus or this one. The bonuses are one point, one resource of your choice, one purple, orange or yellow Keshi, or three points. Fishermen stay where they are at the end of a round, do not move them back yet. Finally, the player with the camel passes it to the player to the left. That new player will be first in turn order next round. Do not pass the Stefan Feld figure at this point. After four rounds of play, the season comes to an end. First you evaluate the river, then you provide for your citizens, and then you prepare for the next season if needed. To evaluate the river, the player furthest along the river gains the bonus on the tile for that season. Each river tile is fully explained in the addendum. Discard the river tile to the box and return all fishermen to the starting space of the river track. In the third season, the tile has two bonuses on it. The player furthest along the river chooses first which bonus they want, and then the player next on the river gains the second bonus. Except in a two-player game where the second bonus is not awarded. Next up is providing for your citizens based on the face-up provision tiles. At the end of the first season, this is just one tile. If you spend all of the resources shown, then everything is okay. And if you can do this, you must. If, however, you cannot pay, you must lose all of your resources, yes, all of them, even ones that were not needed, and you lose the four points as shown. Try to avoid this if you can. 
After resolving the tile, choose one of your remaining tiles and place it face up, returning the other one face down. At the end of the second season, you must now spend all six resources as shown or lose eight points. In other words, this isn't treated as two separate tiles, but all one tile. Then, for season three, you reveal your final tile. At the end of season three, you must pay the nine depicted resources or lose 12 points. At this point, if this was the third season, the game is now over and you proceed to final scoring. If, however, this was just the end of season one or two, there are some additional steps to prepare for the next season. Discard the exchange office tile from the game board and reveal the next one. Place the river tile for the next season on the end of the river track. Each player takes one cache of each colour from the common supply and places them behind their screen. Pass the Steffenfeld figure to the next player clockwise. That player also takes the camel, no matter which player was currently holding it. After the end of the third season, the game is over and it's now time for final scoring. For each sector of your player board, not counting the souk, that is completely filled with caches, you score 10 points. Completely filled means all eight caches of the corresponding colour and one red water vendor. Then choose three of your oasis tiles and score points for them based on what is depicted. Essentially, work out how many points each one is worth and score for the highest three. Finally, add your remaining number of resources, here you have three, to the number of goods caches you have in your souks, in your case four. Divide the total by two, rounding down, and score that many points. In your case, three extra points. The player with the most points wins the game. In case of a tie, the tied player leading on the palace staircase is the winner. And if still tied, the tied player ahead on the mosque staircase wins, unless that's also tied, in which case the tied players share the victory. Marrakesh comes with five additional expansion modules to change the way the game plays. Details for all of these can be found at the back of the rulebook. I've also done a three-player playthrough video for this game, so if you want to see that, you will find the link in the description, or you can click on the little eye in the corner. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Marrakesh. Please give the video a like, leave me a comment, and subscribe to the channel. And as I mentioned earlier, I do rely on the support of my Patreon to keep the channel going. So if you are in a position to be able to do so, please visit patreon.com forward slash gaming rules for exclusive access to the gaming rules community and some bonus content. Until next time, take care, and thanks for watching.